Welcome into the Lucas and Lucas podcast. It is February 8th, 2022. Alongside Lucas Franco, I'm Mike Lucas. And as we mentioned, it's February 8th. The Nets have lost eight in a row, the longest losing streak in the NBA. Franco is shaking his head. He's waiting to tweet out his next poll. Will the Nets win a game the rest of the season? And to know if they'll win a game the rest of the way or not, we need to know what the future of James Harden is and James Harden is and whether or not he'll be a part of this Brooklyn franchise moving forward with the trade deadline two days away, Frank. Do you believe the Nets trade hard and should they trade hard? And if they do, what's an appropriate return for the 10-time All-Star? So that's a loaded question. As do I think they will trade him? It's crazy. I don't know who to believe anymore. Because if you listen to if you only listen to Shams, you believe that a trade is imminent and he's out the door tomorrow. If you listen to Woj and basically everybody else, you think that he's staying and there's no chance they trade him because the Nets are just not entertaining anything that Daryl Morey or anyone from the Sixers front office has to say. So from that regard, I don't think he gets traded. My only hesitation is the fact that James Harden hasn't come out because he can do this. And this is a big point that everyone keeps making that, that he has done. He hasn't gone up to a microphone during a press conference or seeking out reporters and, and said on the record, hey, I want to be a Brooklyn Net. I don't want to be traded to this Philadelphia 76ers. Until he says that, I won't fully believe that he's not getting traded. And then on top of that, you're seeing all the reports out that these, I mean, these, well, there's smoke, there's fire. James Harden's clearly unhappy with the situation, and I don't blame him. I would be enraged at Kyrie Irving for uh, not getting vaccinated. I would be enraged at the New York City mayor, Eric Adams, for not lifting the mandate when it only affects one person in the history of the world. I'd be enraged that Kevin Durant's hurt again. I'd be enraged that I have to carry this you know, cast of no, essentially nobodies for let's call it what it is. A cast of nobodies, you know, Cam Thomas, Dayron Sharp, Kessler was like nice players, but like you're, you're not winning championship with, if those are the guys that you're running out there and you're starting five and kind of gaming, I'd be frustrated with Joe Harris. So there's a million reasons why James Harden should be frustrated and saying all that. I kind of want him to be traded. If we can get the Nets can get Ben Simmons, assuming Ben Simmons, obviously is invested and has all his mental health issues behind him and he is ready to play basketball and doesn't care about anything else. And yes. And along with a Seth Curry and maybe a pick, I feel like you have to do that because, and, 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 and I've thought a lot about this over the last 24 to 48 hours. I think the reason why I flipped on this is because listen, James Harden, 2021 James Harden is my favorite basketball player of all time. The whole list of guys that have ever played in this league, there is not a more fun player I've ever had watching than James Harden in 2021. But I look at his work ethic. I look at the way he handles situations and how unhappy he gets, how triggered he gets very quickly. And I don't think he's going to age well. And I, I don't think these issues are going to go away. And he might leave at the end of the season. So add all those things together, I think if you get a locked in Ben Simmons, who former number one all-over pick, when he's right, probably the top two or three defender in the entire league, an yep. amazing ball hander, one of the great drivers, accelerators of the basket we've ever seen, and a shooter like Seth Curry, uh, who is really coming to his own, who could replace Joe Harris, who would never want to see again, and probably will never play again. Uh, I think that's a huge win for the Nets, considering Horn's not going to age well. He's only going to get worse. This notion that he's like going to continue playing at his MVP level, I think it's absurd given his work ethic. And I think if, you, if you're Sean Marks, and you can pounce now and get, rid, get that headache off your books – I think you have to do it. Yeah, so I, I agree. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a couple different points here. I think first and foremost, if you're the Nets, if you believe that all three players, one healthy, can win a championship together, I'm not going to argue with that. I, I understand the thought process behind that. You see the game against Chicago, the one game this year where all three played. No, they, they played, played two games. Two games. They played the Pacers and the Bulls. The Bulls game in particular is national televised game. Chicago was the one seed in the East. Brooklyn came in. Those three combined for, I think, 87 points, and it was a pure route. And there's reason to believe that if those three guys are healthy in the playoffs, it doesn't matter who's on the other side of the court. Brooklyn will be the more talented team and is more than capable of winning an NBA championship. The issue with that is we've never seen those three guys on the court for an extended period of time. They've played two games together this year. It was a 16 games last year. The sample size over a prolonged period of a season and a half and growing is that these three guys are never going to be healthy together. And even if they are, Kyrie Irving, based on his vaccination status, will not be able to play on a daily basis. So from James Harden's perspective, I do understand the frustration. He left Houston because he wanted to join up with another superstar. So it wasn't solely on him to produce everything offensively and have a guy around him who could take some of the pressure off him when his shot wasn't falling, when he was having an off game and with Durant out, with Kyrie not playing, 
he's back in a situation like he was in Houston, except at least that Houston team with their subpar pieces around him were built specifically to cater to his offensive style. This Nets team isn't built to cater Harden's offensive style. It's built to accommodate guys like Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and James Harden all on the floor at the same time. So I, t- I do understand his frustration. I would be livid at Kyrie Irving too. I, I get that James Harden may not be 100% satisfied with the situation at hand currently, but I don't think that's an excuse to let him almost in a way self-sabotage the season and force his way out of Brooklyn because he's not happy for the second time in virtually a year. This is the same thing that happened in Houston. He forced his way to Brooklyn. And now it feels like based on his comments, the level of play, and just the intensity you see on a day-to-day basis, he's almost attempting to force his way out of the Nets franchise and into the hands of Philadelphia, most likely to reunite with Daryl Moore. Now, with that being said, I 100% agree with you, Frank, that they can get Simmons, Curry, and a pick, or Simmons, Maxi in a pick, or even just Simmons and Maxi. I take Maxi over Curry, but it doesn't seem like Philadelphia is willing to part with Maxi. I think you do it. I think you do it, and I think you do it for all the reasons you mentioned. A, there's no guarantee Harden stays after this year, and I don't think you could give up all the assets you did last year for him and then lose him for nothing, especially with Jared Allen turning into the net all-star caliber center like he has. I think, like you mentioned, Harden's style of play doesn't necessarily cater to an older, less explosive James Harden. And we've seen at times this year where he looks phenomenal, but he's not the same athlete or caliber of athlete he was five, six years ago where he was able to beat any defender off the dribble, get to the lane at will and use his physicality to get to the free throw line and draw defenders up for the lob passes. That's not the player he is this year. And finally, what do you have more confidence in? And it's an honest question. Harden, who's been nagging with or been hampered by a hamstring injury all season long, for him to stay healthy through an entire postseason run, or getting Simmons in there. And Simmons, who hasn't played all year, who's maybe the biggest wild card in basketball. Is it crazy for me to say I have more confidence in Simmons being there for a playoff run than I do in in Harden? And, and he just hasn't been healthy. And this hamstring injury we thought would be over by the start of the season. It wasn't. It happened last postseason. And he's still not back to 100%. This may be something that he never actually heals from. So I actually have more confidence in Ben Simmons being a consistent contributor to a playoff team for the Nets this year than I would Simmons, uh, than I would Harden, excuse me. And last but not least, if you get Curry, it does replace Joe Harris. It doesn't look like Joe Harris is coming back. That's a whole situation that the Nets have to get themselves rid of because with him on the bench and Kyrie, you're missing 84 million plus $200 million on a daily basis that you're just not getting any contribution from. And at least Curry's a shooter that can replace him in that role. He may not be or have the size that Harris does defensively, but at least he brings that gravitational pull to stretch the defense out. And last, last thing, Simmons, who can't shoot, is very limited offensively, fits in with Kyrie and KD, where he doesn't have to shoot, where he can just facilitate, set the offense up, and let those two guys do their thing. And it's maybe the one team in the NBA that has enough scoring from everywhere else on the court that Simmons' inability to create offense for himself and hit a jump shot wouldn't completely hamper what Brooklyn wants to do offensively. So I'm with you, Frank. I'm okay with trading James Harden. And two weeks ago, I would have said absolutely no. So the the Ben Simmons thing is obviously, it's not as simple as, oh, it's straight for him. He's available. Like, we don't know. We don't know where he's at. But I do agree that Brooklyn is an incredible, incredible basketball destination for him. And if that's do are able are able to find a way to pull that off. I feel like, I feel like, I mean, you have to seriously consider it, assuming obviously he's heading in the right place. That's for Harden. I'm just so sick of the constant, Day to day, like what James Harden are we getting tonight? Is he invested? Is he hurt? What what is he doing off the court? I it just he is such a headache, and I'm I'm, I'm so over it. And I and and obviously if he stays, then I'll have to like flip again. So it's a really like it's really hurting my emotions and everything. I don't I don't know I don't know because I I because I do feel like if we just can get by past this stupid trade deadline, it feels like this is, this day is like never coming. It feels like it's been approaching for like three years at this point. Yep. And, and we just got to get past the trade deadline. And then if we could just do that, then that whole, this whole, I mean, it, it won't go away because they can still trade him in the off season. Harden's probably still going to run out in the off season, but this whole you know, cloud that's hanging over the franchise will like go away for at least, you know, a, a few months and you could just focus on, on winning basketball. So I'm, I'm, I'm very torn, uh, obviously, at the moment. And uh, it's, it's just to predict how this is going to play out is it's nearly impossible. I just hope the Nets can win another basketball game at some point because this roster is a joke. And I yeah. hate – I've been betting against the Nets. It's been working. 
and uh, just to help with my emotional, uh, just, I was so invested. Now I, don't, I couldn't, I don't even care anymore. I, I, I can't believe that in, in a three week, and it's crazy. You look back three weeks, three and a half weeks ago, when that, that Bulls game, as you mentioned, what's changed since they were the first seed in the East. It felt like they were invincible. And now they can't win a game. Kevin Durant is hurt. James Harden wants out. Like, who could have predicted that in three weeks? It's a, it is absolutely unheard of what's changed in that amount of time. It's almost like when they blow up stadiums in college football or the NFL, and it's just one button and complete catastrophe. There's not a small leak or, or, or there are small cracks in the foundation, but once they decide to blow it up, it's push the TNT button and poof, everything's gone. There have been small cracks in the Nets armor all season long, and now with the injury to Durant, that was like pushing the TNT button and poof. Next thing you know, this team's completely blown to smithereens and there's no immediate fix in the future because Durant's not coming back for another week or two. Kyrie can only play in 10 of their final 29 games. Harden wants out. Maybe he doesn't. We don't know because he won't say anything. And I was working well, out with a but, guy but, 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 that, but so that leads you to believe that he does want it. If he didn't want out, he would like rush up to a microphone and be like, these reports are okay. ridiculous. I want to be here. I agree. So I worked out yesterday. One of the guys who works on the AM beat down here was a TV reporter in Houston for, I think, 13 years, nine, nine, 10 years, and covered James Harden for virtually a decade. And he said, when things are going good, James Harden's one of the best athletes to be around. He's awesome, friendly, outgoing, you know, really, really, not, really, really enjoyable to cover. When things aren't going good, James Harden is the single worst athlete to cover. He's short, he's not mean, but just kind of passive aggressive doesn't give you anything and it seems like last year Harden was the perfect citizen he did everything right everything they asked for he's my you said he was your favorite player ever my dad who was skeptical of trading for Harden became the biggest James Harden fan in America because of everything he did last year he was perfect on the court he handled himself like a perfect teammate he said all the right things with the media like he, he was ideal in every sense of the word when Brooklyn traded for him and it is so it's just shocking to me how quick quickly and deservedly so attitudes of Nets fans have flipped on Harden because now things aren't going well and he's not giving the effort that we saw last year and, and I think Nets fans have every reason to be upset and frustrated with him because you're paying a guy max money to not go out there and play up to his capabilities on a, any given night and despite the fact that everything around him may be crumbling he is the one solid piece of the foundation that in theory should be able to keep this Nets team afloat and it hasn't frankly done that over the last three weeks. So I think Nets fans have the right to be upset with Harden. They have the right to be angry. They have the right to be frustrated. And until Thursday, I don't think any of those feelings are going to go away. I, 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 as you keep talking, as I keep thinking, Harden's going to, he's going to, in like a couple of years, he's going to not be able to like move down the court. Like his quickness is just going to be gone. Would you, so I'd be so terrified to give him a max contract. I would I be you absolutely can't, can't. terrified. I've decided you can't do it because it's and this is what he looks like now. And, and to go through four or five more years of this on a day in day out basis of him being frustrated, him not being happy because um, in the grand scheme of things and the reality situation is it's not going to be, you know, flowers and roses every day in, in sport. It's just not how these things work. Every team, unless you're, I mean, I mean even like Tom Brady had, you know, went through his adversity and the, and the second anything pops up, Harden is just, he is just the biggest ba- I, I mean, let's call it, he's a baby. Yeah. He just complains and complains and moans and it's all about me. It's all about me. Like the, the fact that he'll, if he does get traded three teams in two years, like at some point you got to look yourself in the mirror and, and, and take some of the blame on Like It's not everyone else. I mean, granted, if you're playing the blame game, uh, number one on the list is probably Kyrie Irving. Cause hundred percent. In, 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 in the grand scheme of things. And, and I thought a lot about this. Kyrie came back in early January and the Nets obviously had the game in Indiana and the game uh, against Chicago. But aside from that, those two games, since Kyrie has like come back to the team and obviously Durant's injury has a lot to do with it. But ever since Kyrie's presence was back in the locker room, they've just fallen off a cliff. And it, it's like Kyrie's like, it, it's like he has completely ruined the mood. I, I really do believe there's a, a part of this whole having a different team for home games and road games yeah. and, has, is, it's really like screwing up the, the chemistry of the team. And I was so happy when he was back because I thought that if he was in the locker room, he would change his mind. But it doesn't seem like anything's going to change here at any moment. Uh, well, do you know what the great I, equalizer I, for that is, though? Because I, I agree. But the, the equalizer for Kyrie being there or not is Kevin Durant. And when Kevin Durant, Durant yeah. and when Durant's not there, those two, Harden and Kyrie in particular, 
has to take on an even bigger offensive role. And that's when their two styles clash more than when Durant's on the floor because they know when Durant's on the floor, he's the offensive alpha dog. Regardless of what they think, they know Durant is going to get his shots and they're going to have to play off the secondary and third looks. When he's not there, those two compete for that first option, quote unquote, status. And I don't think those two in particular are the greatest of friends. I think Durant plays the mediator role between them two. And when he's not there, it, it becomes a, a one-on-one battle a lot of times between Kyrie and Harden, and that doesn't lead to winning basketball. Do you think if you gave Kevin Durant truth serum, does he regret signing that extension before the season? No, and I say that because I think at the end of the day, he wanted to try and win it with his own team. And whether that was the right move to leave Steph Curry in Golden State or the wrong move for his basketball legacy. I think he, all right, was, determined, all right. All right, he was determined to try and win a, win a championship on his quote unquote own. Do I think he maybe regrets hitching his bandwagon to James Harden and Kyrie Irving? Yeah. Yeah. But I also think to say he foresaw the COVID-19 pandemic coming before he signed this contract and was able to predict that Kyrie Irving would become the most volatile figure in this entire sports. I, but, I mean, I mean you, you could argue he was before COVID. Let's be real. Yes, but like to, to see it play out the way it has, I, I just think it's unfair to say, oh yeah, this was a sure, surefire conclusion. Like other guys were anti-vax and have gotten it. He's the one guy that won't for whatever reason. Like I, I, you, you, I don't think you could put it all on him just for not having the foresight to see Kyrie Irving being as much of a pain in the ass as he is. And I still think Brooklyn has the opportunity to win a championship this year. And they were so damn close last year. And it literally came down to him wearing a shoe size too big. So no, I don't think he regrets signing the extension. It's that's why you can't take any year for granted in the NBA. Like you think that, Oh, we could just run it back next year. But you, you, I think I said this before the season, you just, you don't know. You don't know like what's going to happen. You don't know the situations, the circumstances that are going to get thrown in your direction. So uh, it's a really, really tough time uh, at the moment. We just, they just, just got to get past the stupid little trade deadline. Final prediction about this whole James Harden thing. How does this play out at the trade deadline? Does he get traded? My gut says he does not end up being traded. And I think the Nets will regret the move not to trade him. And that hurts. Well, me. I mean, they still can in the off. I mean, they still can <laughs> sign and trade in the offseason. So it's not like they don't do it now. They'll never get to do it. But I think the Nets, the East is so wide open this year. I don't think there's any team. Milwaukee's dealing with its own issues. Chicago's battling injuries. Brooklyn is literally the playing game right now. I mean, that's how bad they've been. This is a, this is a season where the East is wide open. And when you don't have Kyrie on a night to night basis and Katie's coming back from injury, I think. You have to do anything you can to solidify your roster this year and try to make it to the post, try to make it to the finals. And I would feel more confident banking on the package of Simmons and Curry than I do banking on the health of these three guys and figuring out all the issues on the fly with virtually three or four games when they're all playing together. I just feel like that's a safer bet. So I would trade him. Also, a little breaking news real quick, then you answer this, but. The Pelicans are trading for CJ McCollum. Yeah, so there you go. I, I saw. I, yeah, I don't. I don't really know what the Pelicans are trying to. I mean, who are they giving up? Do you just say Josh? Josh Hart and draft picks. I mean, okay. Is that so that the two irrelevant teams doesn't move the needle at all for either team. All right. So that's as we mentioned, they've lost eight in a row. Feels like they're never going to win again. I've done two polls. First time the pub the population said eighty six percent said they would not win another game this season. Second poll fifty almost only back down to fifty percent. So the confidence seems to be growing again. I knew a game, the game against Denver when they scored 75 points at halftime and were trailing that, like, you can't play better offensive basketball. And then the fact that you're still losing, that's just the yeah. ultimate gut punch. So the fact they got blown out in the second half was not a surprise at all to me. But we've been Nets fans for a long time. Obviously, the post uh, Garnett, Pierce, uh, Jason Terry trade, uh, those were really some really rough years in Brooklyn. But can you ever remember a more helpless time? being a Nets fan and just seeing the constant, just day to day, we have no chance to win a game because for me, there's a, it was two that was, I believe the 08, 09 season, they started 0 and 18. And I was at the first win that year and I, at the IZOT center. And it was like, it was like a playoff game, but you just knew that they just didn't have the the, the bodies or the talent to compete against anybody. And every night they just got absolutely you know, <laughs> embarrassed. And this is what this there feels was- like. If, no, you finish. finish. Sorry. Finish. Yeah, this, this is what this feels like. It feels like every night they're just, they're like, it feels like, you know, they play the Celtics tonight. The Celtics are on a roll. Jay Brown, Jason Tatum, 
you know, they can do no wrong. And it just feels like they're going to go out there and, you know, step on, if, especially because Horn's probably not going to play because uh, that's because he's just, you know, he's just not going to play. And they're going to run out there, David Duke Jr., Cam Thomas, Kessler Edwards, Dayron Sharp. And, you know, they're going to lose by 25 points. So I, 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 there's just nothing out there that could be even a glimmer of hope. It's so it's it's really almost sad. Yeah, the, the roster they're going to throw out tonight is the G League roster. Like, let's just be honest. It's a G League roster. And it reminds me of a time in college. I believe it was my sophomore year. Me, Eli, Pat, and Jimmy Rhodes went to a Nets Celtics game at the Garden. And the Nets started Jordan Farmar, Deshaun Stevenson, Chris Humphrey, Sheldon Williams, and someone else who was just horrendous to begin with. And we walked into that game. And that was the starting five. And I was like, all right, we should leave now. And it, had, it hadn't even tipped off. Like, it was just one of those games that the Nets had no chance to win from the get-go. And this roster, I would even argue, feels more helpless than that one because you know you have guys like Durant, Kyrie, and Harden on the bench, and you have the reinforcements, but they can't contribute on that given night. Those bad Nets teams were just terrible. Like, like the expectations were so low. We knew they weren't going to do anything with themselves this that, that particular season. This year's different because they had championship expectations when the year began, and now it's just helpless. The feeling is helpless that – you have guys so close to being on the court for you and, and they're not there. You feel almost betrayed by a sense and it's not their fault. Injuries happen. Kyrie is his own separate situation, but yeah, it, it's not an ideal feeling. And uh, I could use a win tonight. I could really use a win tonight. I mean, let me just check to see what the spread is. If you had a guess right now, that's our home for the Celtics. Obviously that means no, no Kyrie, right? David Duke Jr. is back. If you want to guess right now, what do you think the spread is for this game? Seven and a half. All okay, right. So did you look? No. Well, well, you hit it right in the head. The Celtics are about seven and a half in Brooklyn. I'll probably bet feels, the Celtics. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, that feels like a shot. It should be like 12 and a half if you're, if you're asking me to make the line because, man, that, that's – unless obviously You want to bet on it right now, Frank? No, I got I, I to wait till I know the status of Harden. Not that it would matter. They're still going to lose, so it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, I, 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 but I don't when know. You find out, and, you would, when you find out Harden, let me know because I, I, I will bet on that tonight. I will 100%. When, when betting, betting against the Nets – is so painful and obviously it's it's rewarding from a financial standpoint but it's really uh really messes with your emotions (laughs) no no i did it for the giants the whole second half of the season it was a glorious thing because at least the the giants i wanted them to lose for draft stock and it was easy to bet against them i would parlay the other team in the under and i hit like six of the last seven games it was phenomenal so i think during during the football season i would play this the opposing defenses against the jets and i believe i did that like twice and then I stopped doing it because it just doesn't work. I did it in the, in the Titan game, which they won. And I did it against the Bengals, and they won both. And I and I got they got like negative points. So I, I and I, I can you believe the Jets beat the Bengals this year? Now the Bengals are in the Super Bowl. It's the freaking Jets with that Mike no White sense. at quarterback beat the Bengals. The Bengals who might win the Super Bowl. It's unbelievable. Who, will, who are going to win the Super Bowl? You think they're going to win? I I think the are we going to do the Super Bowl stuff now? We're going to save it for later in the week. Well, we'll say we'll save it for later in the week. Uh, last thing though, did you watch the Tough Road documentary? Uh, I did not yet. No. All right, so I'll just I'll just make this last point. So I watched that stupid documentary. Uh, was, was it good? It was, uh, it's frustrating. Well, well, it was good, but it's frustrating for me because I that that that's stupid. Like I don't I just don't understand. Even like under the interpretation of the rule, Brady started throwing, brought his arm back, and brought the ball back to his body, and then Woodson hit him and snapped the ball out. Like. That was this. Like, I can't believe. Even like, Walt, I tweeted this, and it should have been a great tweet. It, it should have been hundreds of thousands of retweets. <laughs> but the fact that Walt Anderson, that's stupid. I, I don't believe he ever refed another Patriot game the rest of his career. Or he had to wait like ten years before doing another game. But the fact that he could sit in that chair and be like, "I made the right cause." His arm was going forward. Like that is preposterous. His arm was not <laughs> going forward at all. And I think it really is the biggest what if in the history of, or one of, one of the top three. In the history of sports, if, if that path, if that play is ruled a fumble, what happens? To, what happens to the rest of Brady's career? Does he is he the backup in 0-2? and does he never get the chance to you know be a full time starter? You know what happens with Belichick? Because they, they they lose that game and it, it the the you know the aftermath and the ramifications of that one play are so massive to think about and. If Walt Anderson just had a head, just had his head, could just think like a normal human being for five seconds. I mean, who knows how the course of history would have changed. So I will end up watching it. I, my cable package down here, I only get the, 
uh, networks in HD. So I, I try to watch like anything. So it was I was on ESPN at eight thirty. It might still be on like the ESPN app if you have. Like, well, I'm, I'm waiting for it to come on the ESPN app so I can watch it in HD as opposed to watching it in standard definition. Um, which is why I'm waiting. But Frank, overall, when they go back and thirty for thirty is so good, they, they do such a good job. But can it sounds like you can't even buy the explanation as to why. Like in hindsight, twenty years later, you just still don't buy it whatsoever. And, and, and you ask any Boston fan, they're like, "This is the rule. This is the rule." Like, shut up! Don't I, like, you, no, don't give me that. It was don't don't play the rule card. It was a terrible call. Sorry. Do you stand by it? Do I stand by what? That it was still a terrible call, even after. Oh my god! It's so, it's, it. I mean, to me, granted, if they, if that's really the rules interpreted horribly, but. Man, I've been watching football for a long, long time. A lot of painful memories. And that was obviously maybe too little to re- truly remember why. I don't know if I even like, watched that game because I was so little. We were, we were eight, so like. Yeah, I didn't really get into football, though, until like 2005, 06. was like when I, when I really started getting invested in football because I, I, I don't know why. But I, just, I was all about the Yankees and the Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin for the first 10, 11 years of my life. Uh, but I, I can't think of, I mean, a more blatant, like, are you, did they, they really didn't call that? I, I, I just, I mean, it's that and the desk catch are probably the two, like you got to be, and, and the, 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 one. the pass interference against the saints. Well, that was, I mean, everyone knows that was the wrong call, but in terms of like review and, and common sense, the desk catch tuck role play with Brady. I mean, those are probably, cause I think the Cowboys would have won the Super Bowl that year. They could have for sure. All right. Mike, you got to run. That'll do it for this edition of the Lucas Lucas Podcast as the Nets lose their ninth straight game. The sky continues to fall in Brooklyn. And after the game, James Harden will request a trade. And who knows how the hell this will end. See you all later in the week when we preview Super Bowl 56 between the great Joe Burrow and Matthew Stafford.